the king stopped and he said, what is so funny? Why do you laugh at me? I asked for a map, my map makers failed me, the chartists did nothing for me. Not one of them understood. And the advisor said, sire, I served your father and I served you well. <coughs> and know ye this, for I will tell what you need to know, and know it well. If you want a map and you want it right, you mustn't leave them without light. You must tell them what you need in order that you plant that seed of a thorn. Sire, unless you tell them what you want mapped and the purpose of the map, all the map makers will fail miserably as long as you live. What did you want mapped in the kingdom? And he said, well, my son's birthday is coming up, and I wanted to show him all the wonderful places to play and hide, the enchanted trees, the wonderful places where I could talk to the imaginary people I used to when I was a young boy. And I have a question. That's the question the royal advisor asked the king. Which one of those maps was the right map in the kingdom? They all were. All of them were. They're all valid maps. You've probably seen hundreds of different maps. Some will show highways. Some will show ge geological deposits. Some will show topographical information, won't they? Some will show drainage and basins, won't they? They're all correct maps. But friends, the map is not the territory. The theory is not the reality. The model that you want to use when communicating is going to depend upon the purpose you're communicating. The metaphor you use will depend upon who you're communicating with. The model, the mental map that you use to communicate ideas, that too depends on who you're talking to and what the purpose is of the communication. The map is not the territory. The words are not the reality. The reality is out here. The map is in here. One of the most important things we can do when we're discussing things is make sure we match our maps up. Otherwise, we're going to be like that frustrated king and the disappointed map makers. Some of you are thinking, I don't quite understand this, but I soon shall tomorrow. Because when I sleep on it, I'll dream. And I'll dream of the different maps. And I get up and I'll realize that we all have different views of reality. And if I want to communicate with them, I have to understand their map talk in terms of their terrain and find out the enchanted places in their mind so that I can show them the way. Let's talk about public speaking. Oh, I could, you could cut this with a knife when you see public speaking. How many of you are scared of public speaking? How many of you aren't just scared, you find it uh, closer to terrifying? <coughs> That's all right. It's all right to be afraid. It's all right to be afraid. Okay. I've been afraid so many times before I've gone up in front of groups. I used to be scared of groups. And one of the reasons I was afraid is because um, you can fail. You can fail real easily. And when you fail in front of a group, what are they all thinking? They're all judging you. Can't you see them? They're all back there. It's like Judge Roy Bean. Prisoner, do you have anything to say in your defense before we find you guilty and hang you? <laughs> You ever feel like the audience is maybe a little bit like that? So what we're going to do today is, is we're going to go over how to communicate to groups. And I think you'll be very surprised because I think you'll find it very easy to talk to a group. You see, talking to a group can be one of the most exhilarating or exasperating experiences you can ever have. It can be very good, it can be very bad, or it can fall somewhere in between. When you do it well, let me tell you how it is when you do it well. Carl Wallanda. Do you remember the flying Wallanda? They were acrobats. There was a tragic accident with the acrobatic family where they were doing a flying pyramid in Europe, and one of the members of the family slipped. And the family was almost wiped out. A number of them were killed, some of them were paralyzed for life. Carl Wallanda, who was a grandfather at the time, he must have been in his 60s, went back to leading the family, teaching the grandchildren to walk the wire. 
He was a wonderful aerialist and a, just a wonderful showman. He loved walking the wire. He loved doing it well. And he did both elegantly. One day, a newsman wanted to interview him shortly before his death in Puerto Rico. And the newsman said to him, Mr. Wolanda, your family almost all died in an accident from tightrope walking. You're 72 years old. Don't you want to live? And Wolanda turned to the wire and he put his hand on the newsman's shoulder. I remember seeing the picture of this. He pointed to the wire. Don't I want to live? You see that pointing to the wire? That's life. Everything else is just marking time. And when you're doing something that you love, you realize that everything else is just marking time. And that's the important thing to do. Working with a group of people in an audience is a way of walking wire with a net three feet off the ground so you can't get hurt. When you do it well, that's life. I think you'll find it a very interesting experience. Let's talk about how to go about putting together public speaking. What's the thing that scares you most about speaking? Being in front of the crowd. In front of the crowd. Keeping that spit in the mouth so I your mouth, your mouth gets real dry. Okay? Being judged. Being judged. What, what other things? Mental using the using the making sure you use the right words to convey with your message. Or what you want to say. Using the right words? In the mental blocks? Having to speak on something that you know they know better than you do. Oh, that's not possible. I'm putting <laughs> All right, something they may know better than you, yes. I love doing speeches and what have you, and I'm still terrified up to the moment I start. And so I don't know what it is anymore. I really don't know what I'm scared of, because it always works out great. Let me tell you a secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to give them credit for one thing. you got to give them credit. No, I'll, I'll tell you what, I sort of like the group. I like their opinion a lot better than I like the Gary Cooper all G shots. I know I fought off all the Indians, I know I killed 6,000 gunslingers and protected the town all for the sake of you ungrateful people who didn't care anyway. <laughs> Shucks. I like D'Artagnan. I'm going to drill you like a pig. And everybody goes, ooh, do it, D'Artagnan. I love it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. It's like Cyrano de Bergerac without the nose. <laughs> I'll tell you a secret. Not one of you is actually scared of public speaking. You base your whole decision to be scared on a terrible mistake you made many years ago. Did you know that? Of course you did. <coughs> that reminds me of a story. <laughs> the story is this. When you're a young kid, you don't know the difference between your emotions, right? You might have an understanding, pleasure and pain. That's how you let mom know, dad know what's going on. As you grow up, you learn to distinguish between fear and love, hate, appreciation, understanding, calmness, anxiety, panic, trauma, interest, curiosity, anticipation. Now, what you made your mistake with us is that many, many years ago, many, many, many years ago, you thought when you got up in front of a crowd, you were scared, and you weren't. Nobody told you that that's exhilaration, that that's excitement that comes before any interesting activity. Every athlete who competes in the Olympics has what they call pre-star excitement. Adrenaline. It's adrenaline. And you interpreted that adrenaline as being fear. You interpreted the sweaty palms as being panic. And that was your body's way of saying, I'm ready for this. So all this time, totally mistaken, your fear. In fact, you've been excited about the possibility of giving that talk. And I'll show you how to use that. <clears throat> Who knows the difference between fear and excitement? 
think about it. You're going in, you know you're ready for the people. You're going to go out on stage, you're going to go in front of a group, you know your stuff cold. That audience is your friends. They're out there going, I got a ticket, I can't believe it, I get to see my favorite performer. You, and you, and you. They're waiting for you, they showed up for you. And they're just waiting, hanging on every word when you come out. Isn't that excitement? Wouldn't that be interesting to have? The difference between that and fear is fear, that same audience is out there going, I don't like that person. I hope she fails. I hope he fails. I've always wanted to point and go, ha, 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 you fail. Because people love to watch you fail, right? Isn't that part of the fear? In fact, part of what we interpreted as fear was just simple pre-start anxiety. Very normal. But when your heart is doing this, you don't say, this might just be excitement. You say, this has got to be fear. Now, this isn't fear, this is terror. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to reinterpret it as excitement. It's your body's way of getting ready to do it right. Now, the thing that usually I find a lot of people are scared of, they're scared of being judged, they're scared of failing, they're scared of that risk, they're scared of standing on the wire. Their mouth gets dry, their tongue sticks to the woof of the mouth. <laughs> they beg for water, and they're terrified because it just keeps getting worse. They go, oh my God, now my tongue it's bad. It starts. You notice how your tongue gets bigger when you're ready to speak. It just gets, and somebody can't move. <laughs> it swells, and your mouth doesn't just get dry; it gets drier <clears throat> because you egg it on and egg it on and egg it on and egg it on. It's like teasing a junkyard dog, and then finding out the gates open. <laughs> Here's here if. If you'd like to get, get rid of the fear and get into the excitement part of it, and I think you would, because they're both part of the same emotion. First thing we need to do is learn how to write a speech. I don't want to tell you all the technical stuff. I don't want you to write a formal speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. and Mrs. President, <coughs> members of the faculty and friends, let me address your concerns. I don't want that kind of garbage. I don't like those kind of speeches. I don't think they're very good. They're overly formal. They're stilted. It's like wearing a tux during sex. <laughs> oh, soon you've done it. <laughs> ah. It's overly formal. It's like starch in the soul. It's not a good thing for it. Let me give you a few ways of putting together a talk. One is a very simple technique. You can do this on any piece of paper, blank piece of paper. Take a pen. Take your subject of your talk. Back of the piano, kind of in here, high up here. Whatever your subject is, what I'd like you to do is this. And sometime a little bit later, we're going to practice on this. You take just any old pen, and let's pick a subject at random. Let's say the subject is fear. That's a good subject, isn't it? Something we all understand, relate to on a very personal basis. Fear. Take the word fear or whatever the subject your talk's going to be. It could be in politics, it could be anything, and circle it. All I want you to do is take that word fear, make a circle around it. This is something you'll find in a book called Writing the Natural Way that I recommend as a recommended reading list. It's a really neat technique. I should have learned this years ago. Circle the word, and every association that comes to your mind, circle and put up there. Fear, what kind of fear does you have of speaking? Um, people. It should look like those little models and molecules. Let it go in any direction you want it to go. There is no right, there is no wrong. Whatever comes to your mind belongs there. Connected to fear of the unknown. You know what's embarrassing to admit? 
What? When I first started speaking, I thought I'd want to go to the bathroom in the middle of the speech. <laughs> <laughs> that was my biggest fear. Really? That's why, you know, you'd run to the candle. I just to make sure there's no possible way anything terrible can happen. <laughs> is, is that why you wear dark clothes? <laughs>
I did a good one. I want you to just cluster, let it go any way that your brain goes. Don't do any sensory, little circles. When you're done filling the page, and you can use words or phrases might occur to you, a metaphor might occur to you, a sentence might occur to you, just put a few words or a word. It should look like a party of balloons with strings attached to it. I'll give you about 90 seconds more. You're absolutely forbidden to do this correctly. Anyone who does this correctly is cheating. You do it incorrectly, any way that's got to be incorrect. Okay? You cannot succeed at this, you will do it wrong. That is your goal. Now, wherever you are, 
in the course of it. Who has a few, a few lines down? Okay. Here's what you're going to do. I need somebody who's got a few lines down. Raise your hand. Okay, come here. Uh, yeah, bring it up. Uh, oh, yeah. Everybody gets a nap. All right. You, you've got a few lines there. I'd like you to share with me. Just talk to me. Tell me what you see there in about 30 seconds. Tell me what your idea is, Seth. Well, you should talk about what you know about, and I know about science fiction. And given the context, I thought libertarian science fiction writers would be interesting. So I picked uh, L. Neil Smith, F. Paul Wilson, and of course Robert Heinlein, which are the only ones I could think of at the moment. <laughs> Elmhill Smith I've read most recently, but he's used what, what's called a parallel universe, and in his parallel universe he has talking gorillas and bears and things, which I mean, we know they don't talk, and therefore the ideas that he's presenting are, are therefore put out in left field and not particularly believable. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Wilson, on the other hand, is using a more standard science fiction universe where mankind has gone out to the stars. Um, in one book, two planets were settled by called libertarians, uh, one of which was a real martial arts gung ho type of libertarian, and the other part, which was a little calmer. But the governing structure of that part of space is in serious trouble and the libertarians have for generations been saving up hard currency, in this case gold, so they effectively intervene to topple the government but then bring in hard currency to keep the economy running again. And of course they have their gung-ho martial arts people who are willing to cooperate with them to provide force where necessary. Um, on the other hand, this is almost a bit utopian and it doesn't quite seem like it could work. Um, so this brings us to Robert Heinlein, who is one of the grand old men of science fiction, partly for some of the stories he wrote. He, all of his stories are not necessarily libertarian, which, he, which to some extent gives him extra credence. <laughs> But in his stories, he brings up good ideas in a, in a society that seems to hang together. And of course, at the same time, tells a rather good story. So you can read it just for the uh, excitement. A good example of this is something called Starship Troopers, where you get to run around blowing up all sorts of nasties. But in the background, he has these uh, libertarian ideas. Uh, one of which, strangely enough, was a classroom where someone could stand up and say anything, whether uh, supporting libertarianism or attacking it, and the teacher's response was likely to be very good. Uh, give me a paper of 100 words on this tomorrow. <laughs> uh, another interesting idea was that you only had a vote if you volunteered for government service. And you may end up in the army, or you may just end up sitting at a desk and you know, helping out with the bureaucracy for, a, for your two years. And once you have done this, uh, you're released, and you go out and live your life, but you now have the vote. And in the story, our hero is a young man who, realizing there's a war on volunteers, and joins the Starship Troopers, uh, that's giving us lots of interesting stuff about fantastic weaponry and battles. But by the end, his father, who was a businessman who had not bothered to volunteer, uh, has decided that it is time, and he joins up and ends up being a son in, in his son's company. Uh, another good story. Oh, what, what happens in that one? Like, where does it end? I want to know the ending now. I'm going to get <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I left out all the juicy bits. <laughs> of course, with a, with a uh, setup like this, how can they lose the war? So at the end, they are invading one of the home planets, and it ends where you find out that the father has, who didn't want the son to join in the beginning, has joined up, and now it turns out to be in the son's unit. Thank you. <laughs> How many of you first felt anxiety with it? I did. How many of you uh, first hold for me with it? Oh, no. People always do, actually. Isn't that interesting? You talked about something that came off your own mind, you shared it in a way that mattered to you, and everybody first hold for it. I've seen people stutter and some whole audience help them get words out of their mouth. For you. It's a wonderful experience. I know if I ask for volunteers, it doesn't work, so I choose volunteers in the American way, which is all bad. <laughs> Does it work? Now, how many of you actually, oh, actually got a few of the ideas written down after the clustering part? Good, here's the volunteer. Thank you. <laughs> okay, here's what I'd like to do. Place them over here. Under no circumstances are you allowed to give a speech. I would just like you to tell me in about a minute. Share the ideas in the way that they put themselves together with our friends here. Okay? What's the idea of the work? Oh, well, just tell them a little bit about each idea. The subject of sarcasm. And what is it? It's a weapon usually used against opposition. It's ineffective, defensive. It's used by a small mind as a last resort. I don't think that needs explanation. <laughs> it's a refusal to face the problem in your opposition, or the team in your opposition, and it usually creates confusion. Sarcasm hurts the enemy, etc. It, it creates resistance, and it usually results in loss of control. So that's around the back. And you use sarcasm, and then you get a whole group of them like, Ooh. Um, better, consider the problem, and let's see, opposition tells solve. Pretty yeah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
just find them and their idiosyncrasies and their, their special uh, ways of doing things to be interesting. So to want to emulate them and imitate them is a, it's really a compliment. Uh, if you're a, an impressionist and you do this kind of thing for a living, you usually won't uh, do impressions of people you don't like. There's only about two impressions of people that I don't like that I do. I might not, I might find their their voice really interesting, like Truman Capote, for instance, you know, boy, when he's on the Johnny Carson show and tell him, well, well, Johnny, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a very strange voice. <laughs> um, but there's only, there's him, it's not that I, I, I appreciate his voice, but it's his personal life that is a And that brings me to another uh, point, which was the lives and the way that many uh, impressionists and performers live, especially the successful ones, they may be successful in the public mind, but for most of them, they're working on the fourth or fifth marriage. Um, they're like John Belushi, they do either drugs or drink themselves to death. And their personal lives are usually a mess, like mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what I like the most about impression work is that I like to see, I like to see the faces of people light up, and I like to make people laugh, and that's why I enjoy the impression.
someone's personal stuff that matters to you. Uh, everybody has this personal thing that matters to them. And that's a trust secret, so I'm not telling them. Why is that road? Now, Mark. Oh, I'm good with the water. I've seen your trousers, no, you don't. Three minutes on. I was given the uh, subject of an animal instead. And uh, as I would normally be the case, I, I got a little introspective on that. And I, uh, <laughs> I remember that yesterday somebody came in and they saw me convincing all the customers and politics came into the subject so often. And the guy said, you know, you must really like politics. And uh, I was having fun up till then and I stopped and I thought, you know, am I a political animal? Is that, is that you know, that's the use of my Am I a political animal? And I stopped and I got really curious. And I said, no, oddly enough, that politics is the only thing I can think of that really disgusts me. And that's why I'm always laughing at it, because it's one of the best ways I can think of of doing something as necessary as this and plowing through something as disgusting as it all and still coming out on top, because I'm still laughing. And politics is by its very nature something I only do out of a self preservation of necessity because I think others are victimized by it, but by no means did I want to let that person leave my store thinking that I was having a good time or I was a political animal and that's because I reveled in politics. I don't I revel in giving people new ideas on how they can defeat the bad consequences of politics. And that's why I resolved dealing with word animals. <laughs> Everybody in the world and the government is trying to stop you. That's personal. 
It's all personal. And that's the reason I think that Mark's comments really stuck with me. And the others stuck with me because they're all personal. This is all personal. They're making laws against me personally. They're stopping you from fulfilling the potential of the human being personally. They're taking money out of your personal wallet. They're personally preventing you from doing a lot of things that would be useful and humane and decent, aren't they? They're personally taking people out of your life. That's personal. They're personally causing people to die in hospitals by preventing technology from saving them. It's all personal. Now, it's secret public speaking. It isn't, there isn't any public speaking. Hello, it's good to be here today. I'm going to talk to you about politics. You say you want to know about liberty. Well, have I got a story for you. How do you just, you laugh at it because it's bullshit. <laughs> it's, it's pretentious bullshit. It's bullshit on stilts, looking taller. <laughs> Don't you feel the same way when you hear the politicians stand up and give that phony rhetoric? Don't you feel that way? I do. Don't you feel that way when you have someone give a formal talk? Let me talk about our friend, the nuclear explosion. <laughs> It's all personal. The good speakers all talk personally. It's literally like you were talking to me. That was personal. But everybody here heard it. Did it feel personal? Just her talking to you? Would you say that? And did it feel a little personal when Mark was talking about being a political animal and thinking about it and just sort of being disgusted with the idea? You know, it's like, what do you want to do? Well, my goal in life is to do extra waves impressions in the sewer. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it feel like that when that guy said, you get to be politically a political animal for the rest of your life? Anyway? I've never heard a more disgusting implication ever. I can talk a lot of things, but that really rattles me. Because I didn't think I worked this hard to just seem like another person on the street that calls himself a politician with pride. You know, it just horrified me that I could even be compared with such a person. Exactly. See, this is one of the keys to public speaking, is forget public speech. See, when you're afraid and you stand up here and you're in fear, you know why you're in fear? Because you see the crowd. You know what? I've never seen a crowd this weekend. I've seen you, I've seen you, I've seen you. And you notice I make eye contact with almost all of them at different times during the workshop. Because it's really me talking to you, and then me talking to you, and then talking to you, and then we just happen to be in the same room. It's personal. That's why I feel comfortable talking to you. The reason Mark starts feeling comfortable is as soon as he starts making eye contact with the first person. You notice how it goes away because you're attending to them. And you're just saying what's on your mind, what, what matters to you, what's inside your heart. It's personal. That's the first and the most important thing you can ever learn about public speaking. Pick somebody out there who's your friend and you can tell your friend, look out there. There'll be some friendly face saying, I'm rooting for you. And they're all scary to me. They're always there. There's always somebody out there, even if you've got a hostile audience. Out in the hostile audience, everybody's going, there's somebody in the hospital audience going, boy, I have to be up there. <laughs> and they're identifying with you. Or that's your friend of faith. Or you can see that they admire you for daring to speak to them, knowing that it could be a hostile crowd. And Absolutely. You get, you get friendly faces even amongst them. Oh, yeah. But see, that one key, and probably the most important key to effective speech, is make it personal, talk personal from your concerns. It doesn't have to be a fancy speech. As a matter of fact, the fancy speeches I don't think convince. How many of you have heard a lot of fancy speeches in the wind? You walk away and say, well, that was a well-structured speech. It had euphemia, it had rhythm. It had a certain cadence. It built itself to a <laughs> studied crescendo. And then, of course, the denouement made it very efficacious in its implications. Because and then your friend says, what do you think? It was shit. <laughs> <laughs> who, did you, who did you remember? You remember the guy who got up and just... You ever see that at a city council meeting? You hear people, oh, I support the builders, and I want to tell you the builders are blah, 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 and they start telling it. And some guy says, they won't let me fix my house up. He's not a public speaker. He'll tell you, he's the first to tell you, he's just talking to somebody saying, please stop it. Isn't that the person you remember? That's the person everybody remembers. If you want to be a good public speaker, be a good personal speaker. And you know what? There's nobody here who isn't. I've listened to all of you last night, almost all of you, and I've talked with many of you during the day. And some of you have gone to different times, come here, I want to talk to you about something. And I'll listen to you, you have no trouble communicating with me. Because it's personal. 
And that's all these techniques are intended to do, is add to your personal feelings and your personal values and your personal thinking and just make it a little better. It's like an amplifier for a voice. Like a magnifying glass for a smaller thing. If you make it personal, I guarantee you to be effective speakers. Because then all it is is conversation with some person who brought a few friends. They're just listening in, eavesdropping, so to speak. If you view it like that, yeah. I think maybe the summary would be like what I always do. Uh, I have to get up in front of the audience and just pretend that I'm talking to one person. And just as if I was in my living room. And then that's usually if you put yourself in that frame of mind, you have no problem at all. Okay, that's a good point, Mark. Yeah. I want to ask Rob. You know, when Rob was a candidate for us, and he had to do public speaking, I don't think he'd ever done it before. And we, we, we sort of had a brief training session up in our office, and boy, was he nervous, and he thought he'd have to know everything. And of course, as we expected, he aged all their boards when he got to the real thing, and of course, the, the other candidates were appallingly incompetent, as you know. <laughs> but he sounded great, and he never had any training, never had any practice. As far as I know, never gone before crowds, and he sounded just like terrific. And we're talking long speeches and short speeches, too. And, and yet he was very nervous. He thought, well, I'm going to need lots. I'm gonna, they must know a lot, those people, because they're, they're all in government. So they must be intelligent. And of course, the real fact was they somehow got there without any of it. Intelligent. And then Rob shined. And, uh, <laughs> and even the press posted. Yeah, that's right. Right on. <laughs> I got an idea. Let's report this. <laughs> If you treat it as a personal conversation, you come across real well. The best stand-up comedians, if you watch them, do that. The best performers do that. It's very personal. Like one-to-one. -one. You pick up that other person, like you're talking to them. But there's a second secret, and you saw it in every one of these speeches. See who notices it. Who thinks they notice what the other secret is? You may think, see something I didn't see. Hmm? Yeah? I would think that all the speeches or all the talks up front indicated that that's a likable kind of person. I would like to know that person. If I was meeting them under different circumstances, I would enjoy being with them because I detected sincerity. There was an authenticness to what they were speaking about. It wasn't just a speech about something they're there to report on. They were there giving a bit of their soul out to us. And that's the kind of person I would respect and admire. Consequently, I would trust the person like that. And I might even vote for them. Type of thing, if you're looking at it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed about me, and it seems like everybody else is probably fine too, is I was nervous mm -hmm. about going up there, but like, uh, I was thinking, well, Kevin would be nervous. He does this for a living, but by his comment afterwards, he was nervous too. But once he got started, you could just see him relaxing and feeling more comfortable and everything. The same with Bill, is it? Is it Bill? What's your name? Peter? David. David, sorry. And definitely Carol. There was hot, he had to take off his name tag. He is out splendid up there. Okay. It wasn't real funny the first time either. <laughs> she didn't have her name tag on at the dinner, right? Everybody else was wearing the name tag. I said, why aren't you wearing your name tag? She goes, oh, it's hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about Rob in the last lecture. I recall that all our candidates, the three of them, they all spoke from a personal perspective and they all went off. I don't remember any soft speeches about here's an issue we stand for and here's what I think. It was always, you know, I've been doing this for so many years in my job and it's occurred to me, blah, blah, and this is what happened. And they were really interesting speeches. They were terrifically delivered because you're dealing from here, you're actually speaking from the heart, and people did respond in every case. And I only just realized that right now. That, that was just a common thread that went through all those speeches. And that's the key. It's personal one-to-one -one kind of communication, and everybody gave personal examples, examples out of their own life, their own life examples. They didn't, I read in a book one day, <laughs> and I quote, Cogito ergo sum. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> what they did is they all gave examples out of their personal life. He gave an example out of his bookstore. And you could just see him over at his bookstore and he wandered in. And you could see this guy talking to him and him being disgusted. Couldn't you see that? And couldn't you see her telling the stories about herself? I'm up here, public speaking. 
and this and this and this is the way, and you go, oh, I can see her going through that. And couldn't you see her? Go, this is really funny. I, you know, one of the things I find, no, I, I'll tell you why I find it really touching. Because I found you very fragile and vulnerable. And I just, did you feel a little protective? I started feeling protective. Oh, I'm sort of big brotherly. Yeah. Did any of you feel like that? Don't anybody mess with her. But you were there. <laughs> well, did, how many of you guys felt the same way? Did you? Look at all these people on your side. Oh, every single one of them. I thought that was wonderful. That's true. She's actually, she did kind of win me over just by being there, which is like a really fun <laughs> Mark hasn't been elected yet. They're all concerned before they get elected, and then when they get elected, they're part of the game. I can't tell one from the other. You know, you're right. Once he gets elected, we'll stream up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know what you're saying? No news is good news. <laughs> hey, wait, whoa. Have it like a Roman circus. Every five years, show all the politicians into the line. I don't know there's a well, problem with quiet. indigestion in my <laughs> Now, um, the, here's, here's what you've got here, and two factors. One is talking personally one to one, and the other is giving examples out of your own personal experience. Why do you think I use metaphors? They're examples. Why do you think I give stories from my grandparents? I'll tell stories. I tell stories of Mark in my other workshops, and I would tell stories of different libertarians and different activists and freedom in these workshops. I'll quote different people. And it's because you're the, you might not remember the explanation, but you remember the story, won't you? And won't you remember the story? And won't you remember the story? And won't you remember the story? That's the way the human mind works. If you use that, you'll be a really great speaker. Now, what we're going to do is this. Since it's so scary, so frightening to us to give speeches, no one here is going to be allowed to give a speech for the rest of the workshop, me included. I am, however, after this break, going to ask you to give us a little brief talk and tell us a few things personally. <laughs> and we're going to do it using the same thing, because this uses the natural pattern-forming ability of the mind to put things together in a personal, interesting way. When we come back, I'm going to give you each a subject that you're going to find some personal meaning you'll really love. And I think you'll 
when you hear it, you'll say, boy, I'm really glad I got a chance to tell some of my friends about this. Because you'll get the same kind of appreciation that these people just got. Wasn't it a really nice job they did? Huh? Wasn't it?
I hope I'm not overstepping the bounds of propriety. You ever notice how people set up a situation like that when they're perfectly prepared to overstep the bounds of propriety? <laughs> I don't mean to be personal, right? And then they get real personal. I don't mean to criticize you, and then they criticize you. What is this preface? I don't, sir, I hope I'm not overstepping the bounds of propriety, but Sir Winston, you're drunk. <laughs> sir Winston, I don't. You are very drunk. If you don't mind my saying so, this snippy little snip said, <laughs> you are disgustingly drunk. And shame on you. This is, that's all right, I don't mind. Can I say something? Certainly. You're ugly. <laughs> You're very ugly. As a matter of fact, you're disgustingly ugly. <laughs> and by the way, I'll be sober tomorrow. <laughs> I you like you like the story? Yes, yes. I have a story. You got a spiritual story? Would you like to hear another one? Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Some guy I followed him in, and this guy was a noted guy on the social side. And he was staring at Winston Churchill while he was taking a leap. And Winston Churchill said, I really wish you wouldn't do that. Every time you see something large that's working on, I want to nationalize it. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like these anecdotes because I like repartee. I personally like it. Not when I'm trying to persuade people, just because I, I like it. It's a way of sort of bantering. It's like lion cubs or, or bear cubs playing with each other. This is ritualistic sort of fun combat. Sir Winston was at a party, and he was sitting next to Lady Astor of the John Jacob Astor family, and she was a bitch. That's the kind. Of, she was really snooty and felt that her wealth made her better than people. And uh, in her typical fashion, she turned to Sir Winston, who was, as usual, drunk. No. She says, Sir Winston, Sir Winston, Sir Winston, you know, decent people don't behave as you behave. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself. He sat there, he wasn't going to give it the courtesy of a response. He says, Sir Winston, I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> But if you were my husband, I should put arsenic in your coffee. <laughs> Madam, if I were your husband, I should drink it. <laughs> that is not, those aren't persuasive. I just happen to like those kind of stories because they're very clever. All right, one last story. <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright is on the stand. He's being used as a, a witness, an expert witness, in a trial on architecture. And the uh, defense attorney comes up and says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Wright. So, you're, uh, you're noted as being the uh, world's greatest architect. Wright looked at him and said, that's right, I am. He says, um, <clears throat> don't you think that's a little immodest? He says, sir, you forget I'm under oath. <laughs> <laughs> I like those stories. Pass them on to friends. They're always fun for conversations. Now, we're going to do a little bit more with uh, given talks. Now, watching those talks, I want you to remember that about being personal. Because when you do that, you do that. Now, here's your own personal little talk and assignment. No one will be allowed to give a speech. Everybody, all I want you to do is come up for about 30 seconds, and the people have already done it are excused. You can breathe. <laughs> okay, you're excused from this, but you can watch the other people, okay? If you want to be involved, please, you can. So, Mark, you can do it twice. Oh, come on, he's a good guy. <coughs> okay, what I'd like you to do is this. Each person will be allowed to talk 30 to 45 seconds. That's all. Now, you know, 30 to 45 seconds is enough time to get in a political commercial. It's enough time to make a statement. It's enough time to say, I love you. <clears throat> Probably a dozen times. And that's a lot of words. 
What I'd like you to do is this. Here's your assignment. I want you to pick one thing that really personally matters to you. It doesn't have to be political. It could be personal. It could be something you hate or something you love. I recommend something you like. It's more fun to talk about stuff you like. But if you like, if you feel like trashing somebody, pick up something you hate. Any subject you want. It could be dog poop on the sidewalks, to people who don't treat their friends right, to friendship, to kindness, to political uh, liars. And I want you to take the idea, and I want you to put it in the center of the circle. We're going to do another cluster. What I'd like you to do, maybe the word would be uh, rabbit. That would be mine, just for the heck of it. What I'd like you to do is let your mind associate in any way it can different ideas. Just free associate. Any ideas that come up, circle them, connect them. If, if you get a, another idea from the second one, connect that to it. Until it looks like a big old molecule fills the whole page or part of the page. Just connect any ideas that your mind associates with your key idea. And your key idea just has to be something that matters to you. Something that matters to you. We're going to take two minutes to do this. Anybody tries to do it perfectly, fails. I want you to do it imperfectly, please. To do it perfectly, you fail. So you shall do it imperfectly. <clears throat> oh, Mike, give me a topic. I work better with no you. Um, so can fail. <laughs> Humility. <laughs> Ignorance. Ignorance. Yeah. Um, sharing. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't mean I use it. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Um, sorry. to do is with what you've got at this point, take it, stop writing, and just stare at it passively. Just let your, let your brain hit it all in the whole page and see what kind of connections connect. Don't even force it. Just let it happen. Let it happen. As 
soon as you see some connections, take a blank piece of paper behind it, or at the bottom of the top there, and mark down just a few words or phrases to communicate. Here's fine. I'm going to shut it all. No. I remember that class. Yeah, I remember that. It's so funny, you can tell everybody. <laughs> but of course, invariably, you're writing something awful about the teacher, right? <laughs> oh, that was terrible. And the teacher knew it. And the teacher knew it. It was just totally shame. It just sunk right into your shoes. You know, in my class, they gave me an ovation. It was a rough school. <laughs> Anyone who tests the law of gravity through the teacher out the window? Yeah, there's only radio stations 
play one kind of music. They go, hey, we're easy listening, or we're hard rock, or we're something else. And they're all spotted in just, just a single a single type for the most part. And that's a shame too, because most people who like music like variety. I think sales can be very difficult. 
two longer and two very euphoric. And, uh, I found it also was very negative attitude after the uh, sales time. Uh, because most of them tend to be free uh, I would like to think that I'm different than most, but uh, probably not. Uh, I was involved in a business where uh, we sold uh, all stock over the phone. I got out of that soon because I thought it was uh, And you were better than me. To a certain extent, but I still like the money. <laughs> so now I'm in real estate and um, these people get stuck for the money. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. 
the farm. And uh, I need your help. And what's your position? <laughs> I would like to be able to go to churches and to school with, if I could ever just speak properly. And tell us, like it is, because drugs are killing uh, like abortion. I'm dead against abortion personally. Drugs, liquor, tobacco. I don't use beer and coffee. I'm totally against the whole show. But I believe in the right to choose. That everyone has the right to live his lifestyle. And I would like the government to get out of the business of running our lives.
organization, they're necessary, they bother me a great deal in some ways. I have found through experience that uh, to begin with, with good intentions, that they are there to be happy to people. As time goes on, these various strats begin to emerge. You find that the uh, people are now there to promote your organization rather than organization do something for the people. I think this is a danger in any situation, whether it be a church, a lodge, a freedom party, or CIA. Are you a CIA. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a constant battle to keep the proper perspective. And uh, in my situation, a lot of times, when I join an organization, I've been in any farm organization or what have you, there becomes a Veering off in some respects. And generally, that was at the bottom of it. And uh, it's hopeful that this organization now, the MPC, has the right motives and the right ideas and preserve it. Don't get a director's crowd, and the rest of the people are there to keep forcing in the money, etc. There's a real purpose. Right? And these idiots are coming out keeping to the left. 
doing my way. I soon find out when I grow. <laughs> <laughs> you also keep the life. Ah, there's, there's another thing. What if people under your urinal flush and then use them? I thought you should use them and then flush. <laughs> now, I should stop. I've got notes here all over the place. <laughs> But I know Mark is definitely interested in business improvement agencies, DIAs. And since he's so much against them, perhaps he could put a positive use into DIAs. And I would suggest that he champion a cause for some type of washroom or washrooms in downtown London. Thank you. <laughs>
of uh, little bit of growth, which was school and how they're taught and why when they get to be teenagers, they react to what they've been taught when they were younger. And if you don't train, um, that's why we have 18 illiterate, 18 year old illiterate. They can't read and write, they can't do simple math. <coughs> they can't understand why they get fired till they sleep today. They don't understand why other people have to make up for their deficiencies. They've never been taught responsibility. The schools haven't taught them, the parents haven't taught them. And that was, uh, and uh, that's just a little story by God. <laughs>
It's an important book. They haven't read it. And I'm there. I could be the most important person in their whole life. Just that moment. And what I do with my next 30 seconds, 60 seconds. And so I like to think that every day, someone can walk out of my store. They could change their life. They could make it a lot better. They could do something that will change the world. And I had a hand in it. And every day, I feel this happens. I really do. People come in, and they've got eyes, and they're big and wide, and soaking in information, soaking in my words, listening to a lot of things I said that maybe they've never heard before. And I can see it's having an impact. So what comes in naturally to a person when they hear the word ignorance is, oh, that's a pretty primitive, crude word. I wouldn't want to be ignorant. And all I can say is that I wouldn't be anybody if there were ignorant people in the world. <laughs> I guess the main reason is, is because um, 
Often you've heard that uh, times are too high, and that's rather a cliche expression, although true. Um, but usually it's because of the fact that there's no real direct correlation between the amount of taxes you pay and the benefits that you derive from the taxes that you pay. Um, for example, uh, I live in an older section of the city. Uh, presumably most of the uh, basic uh, services that uh, people in new subdivisions pay for, such as roads and sewers and uh, gutters and sidewalks, etc., have all been paid for in, in my section of the city uh, by the previous people that lived there and who paid the taxes when the uh, properties in that area was being developed. So I didn't feel it was really uh, appropriate this year to raise the taxes on my home. I mean, I just moved there because the taxes were low. That was an incentive for me to move to that area of the city because those services were already prepaid. And so the city came along this year and they said, well, uh, we think everybody should pay equally and uh, you know, we have to raise the, the mill rate and the tax rate. So our tax jumped almost you know, to 60, 70 percent in one year. Um, from something in the neighborhood of $1,100 a year to over $1,800 a year. I was supposed by the stroke of a pen and uh, got my damn drug. <laughs> uh, the thing is that uh, about taxation, what really bothers me is that there's almost nothing anymore in society that is not taxed. I mean, the girls are having their uh, douches taxed and uh, toilet paper is taxed and candy is taxed and cotton is taxed. And you know, where is it all on the stock? The main thing that really bothers me about taxation is that it's direct money out of our pockets and I'm kind of uh, new at the, the game of politics, but uh, one, one thing that I think that I do appreciate is the fact that uh, for me, that money equals personal freedom. And if I have, uh, if I am allowed to own the money that I have earned, then that for me is personal freedom. Because money is really nothing more than a commodity that allows you to go and do the things that you want to do with your life and with yourself. And in Ontario right now, all levels of government taxation of one sort or another are somewhere in the neighborhood of 51 or 52 percent. And so that means that for every dollar I earn, I get to keep 48 pence. And um, that means to me that I have about 48 percent of the freedom that I should be entitled to. And that is what really bothers me about taxation because this is supposedly a free country and when you look at the level of taxation and it's not going down, it's going up, uh, you can see that we are not only losing our money on an ongoing and regular basis, but we're also losing our freedom. Uh, uh, this was not one of my balloons, but uh, this is, I suppose, one of the reasons that I believe so adamantly in the Freedom Party and its uh, concepts. Philosophies, because uh, I believe that the trend should be reversed. And uh, I think that this is the only logical vehicle uh, within the London area right now that, that uh, will produce the results that we all so hopefully desire.
I've never been asked to speak publicly, so it's, it's really scary or exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but I just can't handle that kind of excitement. Now, um, your approach to, to this civil exercise was probably uh, what excited or scared most people is you told them before the break, I will give you a topic to speak on and <coughs> that's what you speak on. So I think everybody went to, to be uh, on their break or extended break thinking that they would have to um, be put on the spot something like Miss America. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people thought about leaving during the break. <laughs> I think the day before I was playing around with another sort of thing and, and he had come back. 
and I made him mad, and for some reason, it sort of made me mad, and I sort of scolded him. And that was the last feeling that I had with for the cat. You know, I didn't sort of come the next day and you know, high fives or something like that. And because, of course, it's not just a cat to me, it was a person, I guess it has, it has more feeling about the whole incident that it had been put to sleep before I could really go back to it and make amends. And for some strange reason, that has, it, every time I think of that, it sort of sends shivers up my spine. It doesn't, there's not too many things that you want know, to do to do that. But uh, that's it.
still a certain amount of trust, you know, admiration for people who don't worry, you know, who really to say all on their face and destroy themselves. It doesn't bother them too much. Um, I think I'm less sorry than I used to be. And, you know, I, I think I can have good friends with me. You know, I think I can have good friends with me. So I can all five of my big friends. So we
objective, subjective, evil, good, malevolent, <laughs> <Malibu. laughs> dark and foreboding. You know, we've heard it all from the objectivists. They know everything. <laughs> Childhood is fun, and so is most things in life. Let's admit it. Childhood, you start your life in childhood. We're only going to get started. You start your life at old age. <laughs> Work your way down. Would it be as fun? All right, you're enjoying this too much. <laughs> But they're not the kind of beautiful positive story you hear. They're the kind of stories that we don't discuss. We <laughs> get mixed company, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, you know, life is fun, and that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I 
have a time of quiet solitude. In fact, that's the custom in most in most areas of the world. Yes, the certain things alone. <laughs> the symbolism of water growth actually sometimes has a lot of growth. <laughs>
So music brings joy in many ways. The problem is there's a lot of music out there that I don't like. And I used to work as a disc jockey. And of course, at that time, the big thing was disco. Everything was pounding along four beats. And you could really grow to hate that. But you can't sit and move and listen to it all the time. And there was a wonderfully warped composer that came up with a song that I liked. And I put it on, and it pounded along at its four beats. And then suddenly, there was a fifth beat in one measure. People on the dance floor would break their necks. <laughs> they thought they could dance, and suddenly the beat was gone. They didn't know what happened. But that taught me one thing, and that's the, the music I like and the music I dislike. It can all be a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. 